Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday School class on the doctrine of the church, based on the book by Edmund Clowney. We are approaching the end of this class. We only have this week and next week, and then we'll wrap it up, and we'll start a new Sunday School trimester in the new year. You can see our class schedule here, and um, as I said, we are almost done with it. So this week, we're going to address the topic of the gift of prophecy in the church, and then next week, we'll wrap it up with a discussion on the sacraments. So um, yes, this is a somewhat controversial topic. There are um, Christians who take different views on this subject, and so we have a lot to cover today, uh, and my hope is that we can get through the entire lesson. Um, I'll probably do a lot of the talking this morning, but along the way, if you have questions or if I say anything that's not quite clear, you're, you're free to speak up and let me know, and um, I can try and clarify or address your questions. But I wanted to start by taking a look at a couple Bible passages relevant to the gift of prophecy, particularly as that gift is expressed in the New Testament in the early church. So um, I have a couple passages here from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, mention uh, a man named Agabus, and here's what the text says. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Then fast forward to Acts chapter 21, verses 8 through 9. We read about Philip's daughters, who you might be familiar with. Um, it, the text says this, On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Then if we move into the letters of Paul, check out this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which begins with these words. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So here's my question for you. This is our central question for this lesson. Does prophecy still happen today? Okay, exactly. So we need to define our terms properly. And that's where a lot of the debate comes today when it comes to whether or not the gift of prophecy continues in the church today. Um, it could be simply defined in the broad sense of exhortation based on the illumination of the Holy Spirit from reading the Word of God. That's a relatively uncontroversial definition for Christians today because in that sense we could say that the ministry of preaching and teaching is prophetic in a sense. It's grounded in the Word of God, it's illumined by the Holy Spirit, and it's for the exhortation of the church. In that broad sense, yes, we can, we can speak of the, a continuing gift of prophecy. But when we see what's going on in the New Testament church in particular, there's something a little bit more specific in mind. What we see in the New Testament is supernatural revelation given to individuals by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not just a special insight into the application of the written Word of God. This is actually new revelation. And so that is where the controversy comes in. Do we have new revelation continuing in the church today? Um, now, for context, let me tell you what the Westminster Confession has to say about this. So this comes from the very first paragraph of the first chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith on the doctrine of Scripture. And it says these words, it pleased the Lord to commit his revealed will wholly unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. What former ways is it talking about here? The direct inspiration of God, right? Supernatural revelation. So according to our confessional document, God is no longer doing this because he has given us his written word. We have uh, in Scripture all that we need for faith and for life and for godly living. And so that would make additional revelation redundant 
It's no longer needed because we have all that we need in the words of Scripture. So when it comes to Christian views on whether or not supernatural revelation continues today, there's kind of two schools of thought. One view is called the cessationist view. The other view is called continuationism. Now, cessationism is the belief that the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, like tongues and prophecy, ceased with the apostolic age and are no longer normative. We should no longer expect them as a regular practice in the church today. That would be the position of the Westminster Confession when it says that the, God's former ways of revealing His will have ceased. On the other hand, there is a growing movement that has really picked up in the 20th century and is probably the fastest growing branch of Christianity today worldwide. This view can be called the continuationist view or the charismatic view. So charismatic churches would say they would believe that the supernatural gifts of the Spirit continue to be normative for the church today. So they believe that the Spirit is continuing to reveal himself um, supernaturally to, to members of the church. So these are kind of the two schools of thought, and um, there's been a lot of debate over this. And one of the leading figures in this debate is an American theologian named Wayne Grudem. Now, question, how many of you have heard of Wayne Grudem before? He's one of the best-known American theologians today. He was uh, influential in um, the, 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 the development of the doctrine of complementarianism, which we talked about a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, the ministry of women in the church. Uh, he was also the general editor of the ESV Study Bible. So, um, yeah, he's very, very influential in American evangelical uh, uh, circles. And he has this to say um, in, in some comments on the doctrine of cessationism, which he does not believe in. He is actually a continuationist. He says, those who take a cessationist view argue that once the last New Testament book was written, which is probably the book of Revelation around AD 90, there were to be no more words of God spoken or written in the church. This is especially relevant for the gift of prophecy, according to the cessationist position, because from that point on, Scripture was the complete and sufficient source of God's words for his people. To add any more words from continuing prophetic utterances would be, in effect, either to add to Scripture or to compete with Scripture. In both cases, the sufficiency of Scripture itself would be challenged, and in practice, its unique authority in our lives compromised. He's sympathetic to this objection, right? He, he recognizes that, that if we affirm a doctrine of continuing revelation, that could undermine our belief in the sufficiency of Scripture. However, he thinks that there is another form of continuation that can actually address this objection uh, without undermining the sufficiency or the authority of Scripture. And this is where Grudem gives a, a particular twist on his understanding of the continuing gift of prophecy. So he's one of the leading figures who, who promotes this doctrine, but it is pretty popular among charismatic churches. Very rarely will charismatic churches say that revelation today has the same authority as Scripture. They still believe in continuing revelation, but they do not put it on the same level as the Word of God. Well, how can you do that? Well, Gruda makes this distinction. You have prophecy, and then you have prophecy. On the one hand, he speaks of the apostle prophet as one who speaks the very words of God by inspiration. In other words, apostolic prophecy is inerrant and infallible. On the other hand, Grudem speaks of this category of congregational prophecy. And he says the congregational prophet does not speak words given him or her by God, but seeks to express a concept or impression given him or her by revelation, but which he or she may not adequately understand. So here's the contrast that Grudem is making. On the one hand, he would say that apostolic prophecy is by inspiration and it's infallible. On the other hand, congregational prophecy is by impression and it's fallible. It might be a mixture of truth and error. It does ultimately originate in the Holy Spirit, but it is interpreted by that prophet fallibly so that what they communicate might be a mixture of truth and error. And for that reason, it needs to be evaluated, it needs to be judged, and it should not be put on the same level as Scripture itself. Grudem and others who, who share his view would say, the canon of Scripture is closed. There is no, no more apostolic prophecy. So he says that has ceased. 
but he does believe in the continuing existence of congregational prophecy. So he would say that those final words of revelation, whoever adds to these words, let him be accursed, he would say that only applies for those who are trying to add to the canon of Scripture or claim apostolic prophecy. Luther and Calvin would describe themselves as, as cessationists. They would not say that they were giving prophecy, right? Unless we go back to what I said about, you know, the very broad definition of prophecy, you know, illumination by the Spirit to apply the meaning of Scripture, right? So that's a very broad definition on those terms. And that was, it was pretty common for reformers to speak of prophecy in those terms. But in terms of supernatural new revelation, no. I do want to emphasize something. I hold Grudem in very high regard. I consider him to be a brother in Christ. This is not, for me, I'm not going to call this a heresy issue. It's a serious issue. I'd have issues if he was to seek ordination in the PCA. But I still consider him to be a brother in Christ. And I know a lot of other Christians who hold to some kind of view like that, including members of my own family. So although I'm mostly going to be critiquing what Grudem has to say in this lesson today, I don't want you to min misunderstand the intention of my critiques. I'm not saying he's a heretic. I don't think he is. I think he's done a tremendous service to the church. If you ever read his systematic theology, it's fantastic. In fact, I use a, a simplified version of that uh, theology as a textbook for my high school students at Westminster Academy. So I do hold him in high regard, and I respect what he says, but ultimately I do not agree with this categorization of, of continuing prophecy, and I want to explain why. My hope is that before the end of this lesson, we can get through five main arguments related to the question of continuing prophecy today. Now, this is what um, Clowney goes through. So, Clowney takes the opposing view. He would be a cessationist, like myself. And I'm going to attempt to summarize Clowney's critiques of Grudem's arguments. So, we're going to start with... Um, Argument number one, related to the authority of apostles and prophets in the early church. Do they have the same authority, or do they have differing levels of authority? Then we're going to deal with Joel's, Joel's prophecy that all flesh will prophesy. That's the, the prophecy that the apostle Peter quoted at Pentecost, if you may recall. The third argument we'll look at is the church's foundation. What is the role of prophets in the foundation of the church? The fourth argument we'll look at is the question of weighing or judging prophecies. Paul gives instructions regarding the weighing of prophecies in 1 Corinthians 14. And then lastly, we're going to look at the argument related to Agabus's alleged imperfect prophecy. So Grudem holds up Agabus as an example of a prophet who got the details wrong in his prophecy to defend his understanding of congregational prophecy. So we're going to look at these arguments one by one. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. We're going to start with number one, the authority of apostles and prophets. Now, there's a couple passages we're going to look at related to this argument, beginning with 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where Paul says, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And then a couple chapters later, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 37 through through 38, Paul says, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Here's Grudem's argument. He says, if we see what Paul is doing here in distinguishing apostles from prophets, he clearly puts prophets under the apostles. He says, God appointed first apostles, second prophets. Anyone who claims to be a prophet needs to acknowledge the higher authority of Paul. Therefore, Grudem concludes that the authority of prophecy is secondary to the authority of what the words spoken by the apostles. What do you think of that argument? That is a great question. Okay, I'm going to repeat that for the recording. Would someone like Luke be considered a, a, a prophet rather than an apostle? Same with Mark. You know, he was not um, a, an apostle. Um, he was a disciple of Peter and Paul, and also one of the authors of one of the Gospels. And this is a problem if we have a, a, a category of prophet as lesser than or less authoritative than an apostle. What do we do with all the New Testament letters that were written by non-apostles? We don't know who wrote Hebrews, for example, but there's a good chance it wasn't an apostle. Um, Luke was not an apostle. Um, yeah, Mark was not an apostle, and Silas as well. Some, he goes by the name Silvanus as well. He helped to co-author uh, 1 Thessalonians and 1 Peter. 
What do we do with these individuals if we say that their authority is less than the the apostles? Do we say that the gospel of Mark has less authority for us than the gospel of John? That doesn't sound right, does it? Here is what Clowney has to say in response to that argument. He says, "The, The apostles spoke with prophetic authority, but not all prophets were apostles, for they did not have Christ's call as witnesses to his words and deeds. That point is key. What was one of the criteria for being an apostle? You had to be an eyewitness of Jesus during his earthly ministry. You had to be an eyewitness to the resurrection as well. If you were not in that category, you could not be an apostle, which is why Paul gives instructions for how to appoint elders and deacons, but he does not give instructions for how to appoint apostles. The expectation was that office would cease. That is one of the key arguments for cessationism, by the way, which we'll come back to. Because if the office of apostle ceases, that could also have impact on our understanding of the, the question of continuing revelation. So I'm going to come back to that point. But yes, so Clowney acknowledges Paul lists apostles first and prophets second in describing those Christ appointed in the church. Just as Moses experienced direct contact with God that di- distinguished him from other Old Testament prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. So the apostles experienced direct contact with Christ that distinguished them from other New Testament prophets. But, and this is the key point, in neither case did the distinction diminish the inspiration or authority of the prophets. Moses was held at a higher level than, say, Isaiah or Jeremiah, right? He beheld God face to face, as Deuteronomy 34 states. But that does not mean that Isaiah's words or Jeremiah's words don't carry the full authority of the Word of God. They do. So you can still be secondary in in preeminence or rank in some way, but still be speaking the authoritative words of God. And that point is key. Even if we say that prophets are in some sense secondary because they were not eyewitnesses to the life or resurrection of Jesus, that doesn't mean that their words have less authority. Does that point make sense? All right. Let's move to our second argument regarding Joel's prophecy in Acts 2. And so this is uh, the Apostle Peter's words. So you know you have all these Jews from around the Roman Empire that are, that are present in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And then the disciples, you know, they, the, the tongues of fire come down on their heads and they start speaking in various tongues, known languages to those who are present there. And this is what the Apostle Peter says in response. He says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And so this is quoting from Joel 2. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Now here's Grudem's argument. At Pentecost, we see what we might be able to call the democratization of the gift of prophecy. In the Old Testament days, only specific designated individuals called by God had this gift. And for that reason, their words carried the full authority of God himself. But when the Spirit is poured out on the sons and daughters, the old men, the young men, the male servants and female servants, this wider diffusion of the gift of prophecy implies that there... We don't have a bunch of little Isaiahs and Jeremiahs running around in the early church. That the authority that they each carry individually cannot be put on the same level as the Old Testament prophets. That's one other argument that Grudem gives for why we shouldn't hold all these prophets to the same degree of authority as the Old Testament prophets. What do you think of that argument? And that's where I I think, yeah, so he would say, yeah, it's democratized in the sense of spread to all believers, which is not entirely accurate. Now, I think Grudem would concede this point. Joel is not prophesying that every individual in the church is going to receive the gift of prophecy. That's not what happens. When, he, when Joel pro- pro- prophesies that all flesh will prophesy, he's not saying that every individual will prophesy. He'll say every kind of person in the church will prophesy. By the way, we do the same thing when we talk about the scope of the atonement of Christ. You know, if you're a Calvinist, we don't say that when 1 John 2 says that Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, we're not saying that every individual is propitiated, right? As if everyone's going to heaven. All kinds of people are atoned for. In the same way, we'd say all kinds of people received the gift of prophecy. This is actually how um, Clowney critiques Grudem's argument. He says, but not all believers are prophets. 
Paul specifically says that the gift of prophecy is for some and not for others. And all flesh cannot be pressed to mean every living individual. Joel's prophecy promises a vastly wider distribution of the gift, but in no way suggests that God will water it down for a mass market. The prophets foresee not an inflation of a spiritual currency, but an inconceivably greater glory for the latter days. Yes, Brad. Yeah. And that's not something that's addressed in Clowney's chapter, but in preparation for this lesson, I actually read a couple articles yesterday, including one on the Gospel Coalition, that gives reports of, of widespread testimonies of dreams and visions experienced particularly among Muslim background believers, where they experience a dream of a man in a white robe who encourages them to seek out a neighbor Christian to explain Scripture to them. And this man in a white robe uses terms that they'd never heard of before, but this man allegedly says to them, I am the Alpha and the Omega. No one comes to the Father except through me. Does that sound kind of familiar to you? How They've never read the Bible, though. They've never talked with a Christian before. How are they getting these expressions? And in one report by uh, Mission Frontiers, they they did a survey of, I think, 600 Muslim background believers and concluded that in 25% of the cases, they reported coming to faith through some kind of dream or vision. It's astounding. And you can talk with missionaries who are doing work in that part of the world in the PCA, solid cessationists as well. They will tell you, yes, they have met people firsthand that encountered that. I have as well. Um, And so when I talk about prophecy, I'm going to put that in in a different category because in this case, these revelations, which I am inclined to think are true because they're so widespread, but they're not giving new revelation. They're pointing people towards Scripture, towards fellow believers, which is why I think we could still affirm that these gifts are authentic even if we do not believe in the continuing gift of prophecy. Does that point make sense? This is a little bit more controversial within the PCA world as well, so not everybody's going to take my view on that too. So for the sake of the recording, let me repeat that. Joel's prophecy talks about what will happen in the last days. So the question is, does that expression refer to the the last days of what the Old Covenant era, which we're no longer in? In other words, are we in a new stage of redemptive history where this prophecy no longer applies? Is that kind of what your question is? I think so. At least one of the distinctions. So, And for the recording, let me repeat that because I think that's important. Grudem would probably affirm the possibility that congregational prophets can supernaturally predict the future. A cessationist would probably not say that. Even those who acknowledge like the, the validity of these dreams and vision among, visions among Muslim background believers and Hindu background believers, they're not, these visions aren't giving predictions of the future, for example. right? They're pointing these individuals to seek out a neighboring Christian to explain Scripture to them. So I think they, it, that serves a slightly different function. Right, right. Yeah, and I don't think... And in particular, I don't think, in general, the Old Testament prophets probably did not predict like a long time gap between a first coming and a second coming of the Messiah. You know, from their vantage point, there was just a Messiah who was going to come, right? And so when we talk about the, the difference between our stage in redemptive history as opposed to the early church's stage in redemptive history, um, Joel might not have had that distinction in mind when he gave the prophecy. We don't know what he knew by inspiration of God. We have his words, and that's what we have to go by. It is. Um, And so the difference, and and Grudem acknowledges that point as well, that perhaps within the Reformed cessationist uh, tradition, the doctrine of the illumination of the Holy Spirit might overlap with that, in which case the divide between us is not that wide, right? But illumination is just talking about the special work of the Holy Spirit to give someone insight into the meaning and application of God's word. God's written word. So that's, again, though, that's not new revelation. That's insight into existing revelation. Okay, so here's argument number three related to the church's foundation and what role do prophets play in the church's foundation. A couple key passages from the book of Ephesians. This one, by the way, is key in the cessationist argument because it ties the office of apostle to that of prophet. And if the one ceased, which even Grudem would admit there are no longer apostles today, that would lend support to the belief that the office of prophet has ceased as well because they both play a foundational role in the church. And the point of a foundation is not to keep building up the foundation, but to build something upon the foundation. Okay, so that's one of the key arguments for cessationism. So this is what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And then in the next chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Paul says this, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So here's a key question we need to ask. In these passages, what prophets are we talking about? Who are the prophets of the church's foundation? And I think logically speaking, we have three options. Option A would be to say that this is a reference to the Old Testament prophets. So in other words, the foundation of the church is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Sounds reasonable. However, look at the wording of Ephesians 3 here. The mystery of Christ was not made known in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. That doesn't sound like Old Testament prophets then, does it? That sounds like prophets that exist now at the time that Paul's writing this. So that, I don't think that argument works. It doesn't fit the way Paul is defining prophet here. Another option would be the one that Grudem favors, that prophet here is synonymous with apostle. In other words, when Paul says the apostles and prophets, that's like that could also be translated, the apostles who are prophets. I don't think that argument works either, though. Go to Ephesians 4.11, and you can see that when Paul talks about the gifts that God has given to the church, Paul says that, and God gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets. They're not the same category. Some to be teachers and evangelists and so forth. This is a distinct office. They're not the same as apostles. Even if, even if all apostles are prophets, not all prophets are apostles. Okay, this is how Paul is using that term in the book of Ephesians. So I think we have to go with the third category. That prophet here, the prophets of the foundation of the church, are a distinct New Testament office or um, a, a calling, vocation. And then we have to ask the question, would God build his church on a fallible foundation? The apostles are infallible. Now, if these prophets are fallible, can that serve as a foundation for the church? See, this is where I think Grudem's argument is kind of weak. The, the whole concept of fallible prophecy, I, I just don't think works if we understand the role of prophets as the foundation of the church. And so here's what Clowney has to say in support of that. This high estimate of the prophetic gift, consistent with the Old Testament and Septuagint, if you don't know what the Septuagint is, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament written about 200 years before Christ, According to, uh, that's consistent with the usage of the Old Testament. This high estimate of the prophetic gift accounts for the gifts of those who joined with the apostles in the authorship of Scripture. And I think, John, you were pointing out this point earlier. Silas also known as Silvanus, was a prophet associated with both Paul and Peter in authoritative communication of the mysteries of the gospel, including the writing of at least 1 Thessalonians and 1 Peter. Others like Luke and John Mark, while not apostles, may well have been recognized as prophets in a time when the gift was abundantly evident. In any case, Grudem's effort to reduce the prophetic gift removes the designation that could best be applied to those inspired authors of Scripture who were not apostolic eyewitnesses and ear witnesses of the Lord, but who, by the Spirit, laid down the foundational and final teaching of Christ for His church. The problem with admitting the possibility of fallible prophecy is that we end up creating a canon within the canon of the New Testament, as if the books that were written by apostles are higher authority than those written by prophets at best, like Luke and Mark and Silas. That doesn't sound like the right way to approach Scripture to me. I think we need to hold books like Mark and Luke and Acts to the same degree of authority as the other apostolic books of the New Testament. And that undermines his argument for a congregational prophet who's fallible. Because if he only has these two categories, you're either an apostle prophet or a congregational prophet, authors like Luke and Mark and Silas don't really fit well in either. You either have to say they were apostles, which we know is not true, or they were fallible which hurts our doctrine of Scripture. So that's the, that's the problem that Grudem's position poses for us. The next argument. Are we at number four or five now? I've lost count. We're on number four. Okay, we're getting there, though. We're getting there. We're making progress. The whole question of weighing prophecies. So there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29, where Paul gives instructions for worship in the church. Paul says, Let two or three prophets speak, and then let the others weigh. Now, many translations will add the expression, weigh what is said, but that's not in the original Greek. It just says to weigh. 
Now that word there, to weigh, is from the Greek diakrino, which can be translated in a number of ways. It can mean to distinguish, to discriminate, to judge, or to weigh. So some form of evaluation and making distinctions. That's what we're talking about with this word. Now Grudem's argument is, if prophecies were infallible, there would be no need to weigh them. You just accept them as authoritative truth. But that's not the only type of weighing we could be dealing with here. Because I think, Murph, you mentioned earlier, wasn't there also a problem of false prophets in the early church too? And wouldn't that be a reason why it might be necessary to weigh the prophecies? Not to sift the true from false in a true prophet, but to determine whether or not that is a true prophet in the first place. So, we got two possibilities here. The weighing could be between true and false elements of a prophet's message, which would be Grudem's understanding, or we could also say that the weighing is between true prophets and false prophets. That's Clowney's view, and I think there's more biblical and historical support for that second interpretation. Let me show you a couple passages to support that. 1 Corinthians 12.10, so the same book, Paul says, For to one is given through the Spirit the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits. Now that's the same Greek word, diakrino, for weighing or judging. Notice what's being distinguished here. It's not the true from the false in a, in a true prophet, but it's between spirits, okay, to distinguish spirits. Very similar to what 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. The purpose of this weighing is to discern false prophets. Okay? It's not to sift the true from the false in, in true prophets. This is also supported by uh, the practice of the early church. How many of you have ever heard of an ancient document called the Didache? The Didache is one of the oldest written Christian documents after the time of the apostles. Possibly going back to the, it is going back to the late first century because it's describing practices of the church when apostles were still alive. So, for example, there are instructions that say, when an apostle comes to visit you, do this, right? So, this was written during the lifetime of the apostles. That's how early this document was. And it also gives instructions on how to handle prophecy. And notice it gives instructions for how to do this diacrino um, in the worship of the church. It says these words, And every prophet that speaks in the Spirit you shall neither try nor judge. Notice this, okay? Um, this is actually telling them, them not to judge the prophet who speaks among you, but there's a reason why. There's a caveat given here. For every sin shall be forgiven but this sin, referring to the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That sin shall not be forgiven. They're nervous about doing something wrong here. Somebody gives a prophecy in the church, and somebody comes to judge it and says, oh, that's not from God. What's the danger in doing that? You might just have denied real revelation by the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Jesus said is the unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So the church is, is putting these guardrails in place to make sure you don't inadvertently commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit by falsely denying the authenticity of a spiritual revelation from God. So it says, this is what you should do. This is how you should judge. But not everyone that speaks in the Spirit is a prophet, but only if he holds the ways of the Lord. Therefore, from their ways shall the false prophet and the prophet be known. In other words, look at their conduct, look at their character. It goes on to say, if they're asking you for money, don't trust them. Um, you know, if, if they're walking in sin, you know, uh, and so, um, or if they're leading you into idolatry. A lot of the same criteria for Old Testament false prophets, right? So if they're doing these things, that's how you judge them. But notice, in these, whether or not we agree that this is the right application of what Paul's instructions are, the point you can see here is they're not treating this diacrino process as sifting the true from the false in a genuine prophetic message. Either that message comes from a true prophet or it comes from a false prophet. But there's no concept of a true prophet giving truth mixed with error in their revelations. Now we're on the final one, correct? All right, argument number five. This has to do with Agabus' alleged imperfect prophecy in Acts 21. So this is Paul, you know, he's, he's going on his missionary journeys, and then he's intending to travel to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to face trouble. And fellow Christians are trying to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem because he knows that the Jews there are going to try and raise trouble against him. And so this is what we read in Acts 21, verses 10 through 12. 
while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Well, fast forward to the, the end of the chapter. This is what actually happens when Paul goes to Jerusalem. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. So this is how the prophecy was, was fulfilled, okay? These are the exact circumstances of what happened in Jerusalem. Now here's what Gruden would argue. He would say that Agabus' prophecy was in general correct, but he got the details wrong. Since, one, Paul was not bound by the Jews, but by the Romans, and since, two, the Jews did not deliver him to the Romans, but the commander came and arrested him, there appears to be inconsistency between the prophecy of Agabus and Luke's history. Grudem judges the two small mistakes in the prophecy serious enough to have condemned an Old Testament prophet. What do you guys think? Did Agabus get the details wrong? So, Agabus takes Paul's belt, binds his own hands and feet, says, thus says the Holy Spirit. Now, by the way, that expression, thus says the Holy Spirit, does that just sound like an impression to you? Or does that sound more authoritative? That sounds like the same formula that the prophets of the Old Testament used. So I think the burden would be on Grudem to say, thus, says, thus maybe says the Holy Spirit. Is that how we're supposed to take that, those words? But how do we make sense of the details? Well, look at how Paul himself refers to the fulfillment of that prophecy. In Acts 28, he says, uh, or, um, we read this about Paul. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing wrong against our people or the customs of our father, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He speaks of himself being delivered into the hands of the Romans, which is what Agabus was prophesying. Now, what we read in the actual text of the, the, the event that happened was they were trying to stone him, but then um, the, the tribune came in and arrested him. So, in a sense, we could say that they were delivering him, even though they wanted to kill him, right? So, I think what's happening is Grudem is pressing Agabus' words too literally, right? And so, often, like, prophecies work this way. They, they use figurative language, Right? And so we, we're not supposed to press the details too literally because then we look for errors when, when that's not what the prophet even intended. So here's what, um, here's what uh, Clowney has to say in response to Grudem. Neither the prophecy of Agabus nor the report of Paul is in the least mistaken. The Jews seized Paul and may well have tied him with his own belt for that matter. That detail's not mentioned, but Luke gives no hint that Agabus got it wrong. They also handed him over to the Romans, however reluctantly. Without the Jews, he would never have been delivered to the Romans. So, I, I think Grudem's claim that Agabus got the details wrong is because he's, he's reading the prophecy a little bit too literally, uh, a little bit too uncharitably. Luke gives no hint that Agabus got the details wrong. And what Agabus says, thus says the Holy Spirit, sounds more authoritative than Grudem's category of a congregational prophecy. So, for those reasons, I don't think I would put Agabus in a lesser category in giving supernatural revelation. And that brings us to the end. Can I pray for us and then we can get ready for worship? Let's pray. Father God, we confess that we do not know everything, um, but we do know that you have revealed your truth to us in your holy word. And I pray, God, that you would give us wisdom in handling it rightly.
to be committed to the truth of your word, to bear with one another even as we struggle to understand um, the different aspects of the Christian life and the life of the church today. Help us to bear with fellow believers that we may have some disagreements with, some possibly serious disagreements with, but help us to recognize the more foundational unity we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the saving work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we love you, Lord, and we give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen.